Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile AF, the podcast. This is episode 62 called Josephine. On this episode, I'm partnering with the good people at Pacific Fertility Center, which is located in the San Francisco Bay Area and has been serving patients for more than 20 years. At Pacific Fertility Center, they believe that everyone has the right to create their family in their very own way. They've welcomed more than 10,000 babies through IVF, IUI, and egg donation. And now they're offering free 30-minute virtual consults. So if you want more information, you can check out their Instagram, which is at Pacific Fertility Center. You can email them at info at pacificfertility.com, or you can call them at 415-834-3000 to get started today. Thanks, PFC. Hey guys, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I know firsthand that infertility can affect both our physical and our mental health in life-changing and enduring ways. That's why I've become an ambassador for BetterHelp, the leading provider of online counseling with over 4,000 licensed counselors and therapists. BetterHelp offers a safe and affordable way to connect to these licensed counselors and therapists, and you can do it through video calls, real-time phone calls, texts, or direct messages. And it's super easy. You take a short survey online. I did it the other day and it took probably five minutes and their algorithm will match you to the right online therapist. And you can start communicating in under 24 hours. BetterHelp's mission is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient so that anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime and anywhere. So if you're interested in better help, visit trybetterhelp.com slash infertile AF. That's try better H E L P and join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health. As a special offer, infertile AF listeners are going to get 10% off their first month. So again, go to trybetterhelp.com slash infertile AF. Okay, guys, I want to tell you a little bit about my guest today. Josephine is an infertility warrior and the epitome of a mom boss. She's got five kids, you guys. She is going to tell us today all about her 13 year long journey of love and loss and resilience and hope and how she and her husband built their modern family. I don't want to give too much away, but I will say that not only did they adopt a son, they also used IVF to have their twins. And then they worked with a surrogate to carry another set of twins. So five kids, many different ways. She is such an inspiration. She teaches meditation amongst other things, and she's just amazing. So without further ado, this is Josephine's infertility story. Hi, Josephine. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show, Allie. Thank you so much for doing this. So I know you've got a really interesting story and I'm going to just kind of start at the beginning. I always love to ask people, you know, growing up, did you always want to be a mom? Did you always want to have kids? I always knew that I did want to have kids. So it's only, I only have a younger brother, Mm -hmm. but growing up, my, I was surrounded by so much family. My mom comes from a family of 10. And a majority of them, when I was little, we all lived in this duplex in Chicago. And so I was surrounded by all of my aunts and uncles and my cousins. And so I grew up in a big family environment. And, you know, looking back, those were some of my fondest memories is when we would be in my, in the, my grandmother's apartment where everyone congregated. And just filled with music and dancing because my my aunt and uncles loved to to dance like disco at the time, Fun. And, like sing. And there is always cooking happening, um, which actually led me to pursue 
a degree in culinary education. So, you know, it, it was just really happy for me. And I knew that this was something that I wanted to replicate in my own life in the future. Okay. So what happened when you were, you know, later in life when you, when you started to think about having kids and started to try? So when my husband and I got married fairly young, and so I was around 22 when we got married and, you know, we spent the first few years of our marriage just settling into our own careers. And we knew that we would have to pursue non-traditional methods of having children because of a prior illness that my husband had. Mm -hmm. And so we were going to start with IVF. And we knew that in order to have this big family that we wanted, that we would eventually do adoption as well. But we wanted to start with IVF. And so probably about four or so years into our marriage, we thought this would be a great time to start since I was about 25, 26 when we were starting then. And, you know, it, the numbers said that it would be better to be younger to start trying. So that is how we got into IVF. Mm -hmm. And we were living in Boston at the time and we felt so fortunate to be out there because it's a great, it's a great city to live in, in terms mm -hmm. of all the hospitals and all the, all the um, medical facilities out there. And we started with one of the bigger hospitals out there and had a pretty rough go the first few years. Mm -hmm. I just naively thought because of my age that, you know, it wouldn't be so difficult, especially since I didn't have any existing conditions that we knew of that would prevent me from getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. But it did prove to be very difficult those first couple of years. Uh, it was very disheartening. And then... Do you mind if I ask what, what happened? What was going sure. On? Yeah. Yeah. It was just, you know, we didn't do our research going into it. We went with a big name facility and it was because it was a bigger hospital versus a smaller sort of uh, location, you know, it felt like, it almost felt like every time you walked into the hospital, you, you were sick because when you go into a big hospital, that's typically what you're there for. And so right from the beginning, it had this sort of feel of that there was something wrong with me. And so, and that's kind of the feeling that I felt throughout that first year or two working with this institution. And it wasn't, it wasn't as warm and fuzzy as a smaller operation. So I felt like just another patient, another number. And, and so that was part of the problem. And then, you know, the, I didn't feel like I was getting enough guidance especially during that first treatment, you know, you're supposed to, when you do your IVF and you have the egg transfer, you're supposed to have drank enough water and um, so that it, it allows the uterus to be lifted for better implantation so that mm -hmm. they can see through the ultrasound. And so you know, that first experience was really tough because I didn't drink enough water. And so it was really, and then the doctor was just a little upset about it. And so it wasn't a great relationship from the beginning. And after about a year and a half of working with them, we decided to pivot to a new facility, a smaller one that was just doing IVF. And it was such a dramatic difference mm -hmm. in our relationship and how I felt and how I was treated there. I mean, it was night and day. And it really made for such a difference mentally in how I was going into the, the experience. Yeah. Because I mean, IVF in itself is just such a big mental game as it is. And so you want to have the best experience going into it and have the best experience for yourself to carry you through such a difficult journey. Right. As you're aware. So that, that I mean, that was that was that first year and a half. And then when we moved over to the second facility, it turned out great. I did become pregnant, but unfortunately I lost, it was a twin pregnancy and I carried them through to 17 weeks and then we lost the pregnancy. Oh, so, so sorry. Yeah, that was tough. And so, you know, I took a break after that. Uh, I didn't think like mentally, I just couldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. So we decided to pivot once again in this journey and thought of 
maybe this was the time to pursue adoption Mm -hmm. and just fix what our, our timeline was. And so that's when we moved on to international adoption. And, you know, we thought about doing domestic adoption, but after going through that, that loss of the twins, Mm -hmm. I couldn't bring myself to do uh, a domestic adoption where the, the birth mother can actually change her mind Mm. at the last minute. Uh, I just couldn't do, put myself through that. So that's what, that's why we ended up going with international adoption, even though it would take longer. Okay. Um, Is it always different when you do international? I guess I don't know much about that. Like they, they don't have the same option to kind of change their mind like they do in the States. No, depending on the country. So in most countries, the child is already born Mm -hmm. or the child is, say, is about to be born. Okay. um, And the the mother has already waived the rights. So, but so we went with a country where the children were already born. Okay. So that we wouldn't have to face that, that possibly difficult like situation. Right. What country was Uh, it? So we went through Kazakhstan because they actually had the shortest wait time. Mm-hmm. Typically, a wait time would be about a year or two, especially if you go into more popular countries like China. Especially if you're looking for if you're looking for a girl, a daughter is very prized, and you know we didn't we were open to any possibility. And we had the luxury of being able to actually stay in Kazakhstan for a month. Oh, wow. Because that was, that was part of the, um, the issue with that program. And what I think why it went so fast is because it's hard for people to take a month off. I mean, let alone a week off of for vacation, but taking a month off to have to live in the country, which is part of that country's requirement definitely prevented a lot of people from doing that program. But Mm -hmm. I think it was wonderful for us to actually go out there and have that experience because now we are able to answer, you know, some of the questions from our son about what his home country was, was like Mm -hmm. when we were there and just what the people were like and the food, you know, and have some sort of knowledge that we can share with him because he already had so little Mm -hmm. to draw, draw upon. So So. did you say that, sorry, was he already born or he was about to be born when you, he was already born. He we adopted him at 10 months. Wow. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a wild experience. I mean, the biggest part of this journey for me, and I think for most people who are doing an infertility, have an infertility journey is this loss of control. Mm -hmm. And that's no different from adoption, surrogacy, the IVF. It's just different levels of it and different ways it presents itself. Right. And so with, with the adoption out there, we were at the mercy of like the translator. We were at the mercy of the in-country adoption people who were helping to facilitate the whole process. And it was hard because there was the, the language barrier and we didn't really know, we didn't know the area. I mean, there's mm-hmm. so, there so many different factors that we didn't have control over and versus when you're doing surrogacy and or IVF and you're at the mercy of the 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 lab and the doctors and right. just whatever nature decides to do within your own body. I mean, so there are just many different ways where you mm-hmm. have to deal with a lack of, of control and sort of Absolutely. trust the process. And yeah. So but it was it was a wild experience to be living in a in a new country. I right. had never done that before. So And um, I'm gonna sound like a total idiot, but what language did they speak there? Uh so in the part that we were in, they actually spoke Russian because okay. it's such a massive country mm-hmm. that when you start from the top it borders Russia and then you work your way down mm-hmm. and it's closer to China. Okay. Um so it's like the United States where you have different, you know, you have the south and the north. And sure. um, and so yeah, so they spoke Russian. Okay. There. And then your son, was he living in like a orphanage kind of situation or like what yeah, so every um I think most people who adopted 
did end up going through an orphanage because they were, you know, they're already older yeah. um, and weren't able to stay in the hospital. So gotcha. Yeah, it was surreal to to finally, like after all those years, to like finally become a mom and have that experience. And it was just really it was it was great to as as you know, to finally Mm-hmm. You know, step into that role and live that dream that you had been trying to create for so long. For sure. So how old is he now? And now he's 13. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> I know that you have four other kids. So tell me yeah. about that. Like what, what happened next? Yep. So then about a year after having our son at home with us, I was ready, like I was mentally and physically ready to try IVF again. Mm-hmm. But this time we did our homework and we you know, talked to other people and found facility that had the best success rates in the country and actually in the world. And so we went with them, even though it was not in New Hampshire or Massachusetts where we were living. So where was uh, that? I said that was in Colorado. Mm, okay. And, um, we, you know, I, in my mind, I felt like I could only do it maybe a few more times. And so I thought if we're going to do it, we should just go where we have the best chance. And so, and we were fortunate enough to be able to have help with our sons, you know, every time we'd have to fly out there for um, tests and for the actual procedure. So that's what we ended up doing. And Mm -hmm. again, it was just like the other facility. It was a fantastic experience because right from the beginning where we felt like all of our questions were being answered and we felt like we were part of a team that was working to make this happen. And so I felt really comfortable, even though it was an out-of-state situation. And we became pregnant again with twins. And this this time we threw the kitchen sink at it. And so I, once I became pregnant, you know, this time I worked with a maternal fetal medicine doctor and they decided to perform a cerclage where they tied up my cervix and I was on modified bed rest for most of the pregnancy. And yeah, I was able to carry the twins to full term and we were, we delivered boy girl twins who are Mm -hmm. now 11. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so that that pregnancy was, you know, back to the idea of this loss of control. That was, it wasn't a fun pregnancy for me. I was just nervous the whole time. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, when I lost the first pregnancy, they really didn't have an idea as to what went wrong. So I was constantly questioning myself and I was right. constantly in fear of something that I would do to make me lose this pregnancy. And so, and it was hard already to have a three-year-old or I think it was two at the time, you know, to have to like also care for him. So eventually we did have to get someone to help because I couldn't carry him since I was on modified bed rest and I couldn't like run after him. Mm -hmm. Um, So that part was definitely tough, but we made it through and, you know, I think that's a, sorry to interrupt. I think that's such a common thing when you know, someone's gone through infertility or had a loss, you're never able to fully relax, right? And the whole time when, if you do get pregnant again, and I certainly wasn't with my son and I just got like a flashback of like the feeling of that nervousness. And I don't think it ever really fully goes away, even when they're born. And, you know, there's some sort of like protectiveness or like fear that's always kind of looming that something's going to happen once you've experienced a loss, right? Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't, it was always in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, you know, I I was like walking on eggshells the whole time. Totally. Which is similar to what we're experiencing right now with this pandemic is just this like fear that you have that sort of consumes you. Yes. Um, but we made it through somehow and, you know, they're thriving now, which is great. Uh-huh. And so, you know, after, because I was on the younger side, we got a lot of embryos from that, from that um, experience out in Colorado and we kept them frozen. 
And we knew we wanted a big family. But after that pregnancy, I just could not bear the idea of being pregnant again. So we kind of just kept, you know, this idea of having more kids and what to do with these embryos on the back burner. Mm -hmm. We would get a letter every year asking what we wanted to do with the embryos. And that would be the time that we would reevaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. What should we do with these, these embryos that we worked so hard to get? And none of the options that they, they gave you in that letter were viable for me. Like I would not, I would not discard them as much as I would love to help other people out by donating an embryo. I just mm-hmm. couldn't bear the idea of knowing like my child is out there. So, so we just would keep them frozen every year. And then, you know, as the kids got older, the idea of being on bed rest again and going through that whole process in order to try to, you know, become pregnant again with right. the embryos that we had just didn't seem feasible. And yeah. So, How long you know, were you on bed rest with the twins? Pretty much from like in the beginning as modified and then towards the middle to half of the pregnant wow. end of the pregnancy it was I was that's where I was. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> um so so yeah, so we just kept prolonging it. And then at some point we were fortunate enough to entertain the idea of pursuing surrogacy because it's just so expensive and we couldn't afford it before. And we thought, why not give it a shot? Mm -hmm. And that's how we started the idea of doing it. And we went back to that facility in Colorado because we knew we would use them again, whether it was me or if it was a surrogate. And Mm -hmm. that's how we found a surrogate to work with. And then that's how we started the whole process. And we implanted two embryos and she became pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. And that whole situation, again, was another way for me to experience grappling with this idea of not having control, but again, in a completely different way. And um, absolutely. And this time trusting someone else. It's again, this time this was a really big lesson in just trusting another person. Uh And how did you decide that she would be the right surrogate for you? Yeah. So they sent over kind of similar to the adoption where they sent over a dossier and there were some questions that the surrogate answered about her own experience raising children and why she wanted to be a surrogate. And it really just resonated with me. Like it Mm -hmm. came across and in that, that dossier, like this genuine and earnest desire to help other people yes, and her love such- of being a mom. Yeah. Like that came through. It's such and- a common thing with everyone I talk to who has used a surrogate that, you know, everybody uh-huh. says that the, the women who do this just want to help other people. And you know, it's such a great, it's so great to hear that because I think that there's still like a little bit of a misconception about surrogacy. But yeah, it came across in, in the paperwork and then we interviewed them through the computer because they were out in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And that's how we decided upon them. They were just so wonderful. And, but it was tricky to form a relationship with the surrogate. Mm-hmm. Not because, you know, she wasn't a great person, but it, it was because it's such a unique relationship. Mm-hmm. Then there's, there are no rules for how you're supposed to feel and act around this person. Like, what is your role? Are you friends or are you almost like a caregiver to this mm-hmm. person? I mean, that's where I sort of lean towards. I, going back to that idea of this like maternal instinct, I felt like she was almost part of my family that mm-hmm. I had to care for and check in on and see how yeah. she was doing, like in terms of what how she was eating, how she was feeling. I mean, that's how that relationship sort of formed. Right. How did and, you how involved were you with the pregnancy? Like were you doing like FaceTime doctor's visits or like what was the involvement? Oh, that- there? That would have been nice, actually. Now, <laughs> now at the time we didn't do face that. I would get a call from her right after the doctor's okay. visit. She's yeah. always very great about that. And then the nurses would also call right after. But I did go out for a 
for two visits. Mm -hmm. So I was able to go out for like the big 20 week visit and I was able to be involved in in that appointment. And, you know, then we went out again and had our families meet, which was great. Yeah. Just for the, for both sets of kids to really understand and get a better idea of what was happening because they're all little. She had kids of her own. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they were all sort of similar in age. And mm-hmm. so you know, it was hard for her kids to understand that they were not going to have a sibling. And it right. was difficult for my kids to understand where was this you know, baby coming from. Sure. And they had, we had already discussed our older son's birth story of adoption. So they, they kind of thought it was like adoption. So we had to make it clear that it you know, wasn't. And so this visit really helped that. Yeah. So yeah, so the the overall pregnancy, although, you know, there was that loss of control and trust, you know, it worked itself out and then she delivered two healthy twin boys. Wow. So I have four boys and a girl. Oh my and, goodness. Uh, so their ages now are what? 13, 11, and four. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah it is. Quite a busy household. Yes. Tell me about your day to day. Like what's the five kids during a pandemic? (laughs) What is that like for you? I can barely hold it together with two. I mean, I called, I actually called my kids jerks yesterday when we were out taking a walk because we were like, we don't want to walk. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? There are (laughs) nurses and doctors who are fighting for their lives and we're walking down the street and you're complaining. Like I was like, you guys are being jerks and they both started crying. Oh no. Not my proudest moment as a mom, but real talk. Real talk. Yes. No. Ever just my son was like, that's not a nice word, mommy. And I was like, well, you're not being a nice person. (laughs) I've lost my shit so many times in the last six weeks. I can't even tell you. Yes, I would. Um, ra- I'm raising my hand as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because I have like the whole spectrum. It's just it's kind of nuts over here. The older right. three have been have been actually great mm-hmm. about taking ownership of their online schooling. I try to prod them about talking about their feelings, but that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily come out. So. So that part of me worries about them because Mm -hmm. I wonder how they're actually feeling inside. But we make a good point of, you know, every night has now become movie night. And so I think we're going to run out of things to watch, but... um, (laughs) No, that's impossible. Do you have Disney Plus? We do. We have Disney Plus. We have Hulu. We have Yeah, yeah. All the things. All the things, yes. But it's our way of like having them corralled together and then usually some things will pop up here and there. So that's been good. I would love to ask, you know, just kind of wrapping it up, how, you know, you've gone through obviously all these different routes, you know, to have your kids, which is so beautiful. And how has this, all of this changed you as a human being? Because I've said this before many times, but I do feel like going through infertility profoundly changed me as a human being. So what about you? Well, it has, you know, we already touched upon this idea of like losing control. And so that has always been a big issue for me just as an individual. So I've had to grapple with that, which has been a great exercise, especially, you know, putting it into play in like the current situation that we're in. I feel like that whole infertility experience has really helped me in being able to deal with our situation today because it's similar in that, you know, there's only so much that we can control right now. And that whole experience has helped me to navigate like how I react and how I mm-hmm. respond to everything that we're dealing with. And and then the other thing is that it really just brought up this passion for me to help others. And you know, I didn't want that whole journey to be for nothing aside from having this beautiful family, which I'm just always every day grateful for. But, you know, as as you're experiencing and doing with your own like amazing podcast Mm. is shining a light on other people's experiences Mm -hmm. so that others don't feel alone and, you know, can commiserate that, 
you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel with whatever way it sort of manifests itself mm-hmm. into, into having your, your family mm-hmm. or not having a family eventually. Right. But, you know, this whole experience changed me in that it showed me a way to help others. And, and so I'm doing it then through like my, med- I'm a meditation teacher. Right. And yeah. Tell so, me about the meditation. Yeah. So I'm able to carry over this idea of like resilience and experience and loss and stress and all of that into how I teach, you know, primarily corporate clients, but, but how I teach other people to, to deal with their own obstacles and adversity in life in order to find their own joy. And so I draw a lot from that infertility journey. And because, you know, going through it, that you experience so many like roller coaster of emotions and experiences in life through that one snippet in time of your own life. And so I'm able to, you know, help people with their, with their stress by drawing upon how I manage my stress. And so, you know, I'll bring in things like breathing techniques and body scans, like tuning into our body and Mm -hmm. noticing where we're holding on to tension, which is also like a big deal for infertility as you're going through it. Did you meditate Um, while you were going through it? No, you know, I wish I had because it really, like, it really would have helped me out. Instead, Mm -hmm. it manifested eventually like this this grip of control that I needed to have manifested into an eating disorder, like, like halfway through this infertility journey of mine, mm-hmm. became bul- bulimic because like it was the only thing that I could control, which was just, I never thought would have happened to me. Bulimic? Um, is that what you said? Yeah. I, oh. I, yeah. I became wow. bulimic because I just couldn't, like there was no way for me to deal with that stress and mm-hmm. that, like inability to control my life that Mm -hmm. like suddenly, you know, I always had fitness and I would just would always work out. Like that was my way to relieve stress. But then as you know, like when you're on bed rest and you're doing infertility, there are certain moments when you're asked not to like exercise vigorously, like you can go for walks, but like that just drove me just, I needed an outlet. So Mm -hmm. I wish I had meditation that because during those times when I couldn't go to my other outlet of fitness, then it would have been so helpful. Right. Um, But yeah. um, How did you get over the bulimia? uh, I went into therapy for it and, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a hypochondriac by nature. So I didn't want to be sick in this way. Um, And so, you know, I, it was about a year into it. I decided I just, this is not healthy and I need yeah. to figure this out. I'm a right. problem solver. And so I checked, like, I checked myself into some like group therapy and yeah. worked through it that way. But, but yeah, so I wish yeah. I had, I the had meditation. that. In, sorry to interrupt. I've, I've, yeah. I had touched on some bulimia. I wasn't like hardcore, but in college, uh-huh. That was definitely a thing for me too. And it was mostly just like, you know, you go to college and you eat all the pizza and drink all the beer and gain all the weight. And then like right. that became a thing for me. So I've, I had struggles with that too. So it's interesting to hear that I haven't heard of it like linked to infertility, but that makes perfect sense. Cause it is, it's like a, a control thing. Right. Yeah. And well, that's what sort of, you know, you think about it as more of something that teenagers or college students do Mm -hmm. for exactly those reasons. So when it happened to me, when I suddenly started doing it in like my mid thirties, it just threw me for a loop because I did not expect it to manifest in that way. Um, But apparently all the stress and all the like loss issues just finally like bubbled up and needed a way to express itself. Right. Wow. That's so interesting. I'm so glad that you're, healthy now because yeah. you know that's a really scary thing to go through too yeah yeah totally. so you know i'm able to bring that into the meditation teaching right. as well Absolutely. but so you know that's how this experience going back to your question that's how i feel like this experience has changed me is that it's just brought to light all the different ways that i can use my experiences to help other people and yeah so it's been really quite rewarding to be able to 
you know, share my story because it's so unique and be able to have conversations with women about like the different options out there and not feel stuck to just one. Absolutely. An option. I think that's a, like we get so caught up in, in the moment as we're doing it with infertility, like we're in IVF, the IVF track and you just, uh, you're like, uh, have the blinders on and you just, you know, you just want to get it done. And so you just keep doing it without mm-hmm. taking a, a pause, which is what I teach in meditation is to take a pause to just be in the present moment. But then also it gives you an opportunity to like reevaluate your situation because as you keep going on and on in it, it's changing you, whether you realize it or not. Mm-hmm. And so maybe, you know, by taking that pause as we practice in meditation, pausing in your journey to reevaluate, like, is this still what I want? Is this, can I pursue something else? You know, am I ready to like go to a different facility or, you know, so many different options, but like, I feel like even in my own journey, I felt like I was just stuck on one track mm-hmm. or, and I was scared to, I was scared to change track yeah. because of all the time that I invested in in that. And plus, it's also an issue of time as well. Okay, guys, so thanks so much for listening to my conversation with Josephine. And Josephine, thank you so much for sharing your story and for letting us know about all the hardships you overcame and how you're thriving today and helping so many people. I'm going to post some more info on her meditation session so you guys can have access to that as well. On a separate note, I wanted to let you guys know in case you didn't hear already that my Fertility Rally co-founder, Blair, and I made a huge announcement that we are launching Fertility Rally memberships, which are going to be amazing space that's a no judgment zone where everybody's welcome where we're going to celebrate all things fertility infertility and building modern families we have a lot of stuff that we're going to be putting on our site it's going to be an all-inclusive searchable community or you can stay anonymous if you prefer virtual and ril fertility rally events unlimited support groups which we like to think of as free therapy curated expert advice, an extensive video library, exclusive content and podcasts and member discounts and giveaways and so much more. So for more info, definitely check us out at fertilityrally.com or you can follow us on Instagram at Fertility Rally and it's all linked in my Infertile AF Stories bio as well. But we would love to have you guys join our community. And also if you're thinking of a way to gift something to somebody. If you have a loved one who's going through infertility or a good friend, we're going to be offering gift memberships as well. So thank you for your interest in that. We hope to see you guys there and I will talk to you next time. true crime, and in bed by nine. So do we. This is Tab and Gretch from Housewives of True Crime Podcast. We are mothers of many messy little creatures, lovers of a nice cocktail, and fascinated by true crime stories. When we're not cleaning up our own dirty laundry, we're basic detectives digging in others' dirt. Join us every Monday. Or it's a podcast, so catch us all week long if you want. We promise you won't be bored. We tell you a true crime story on the lighter side so you can still sleep at night. We are housewives of true crime. Clink, clink. Clink, clink.